As the conversation about Australia's brutal past is being reconciled, it is important that we recognise European settlers who disagreed with the government's policy of racism. Many who walked up north came to rely on the help and guidance of Aboriginal people. After all, they were strangers in a very strange land. Learning their language and knowledge of the environment was a prerequisite to reaching their goal. Without them, they would have perished. Lifelong friendships were forged in a time when massacres and the cruel treatment of Aboriginal people became a stain on our conscience. The children of those first settlers and the children of the murdered Aboriginal people are still dealing with the issues that divide our country today. We must look to those that showed a deep respect for Aboriginal culture. One example was Ben Nicka, who made the effort to learn the ways of Aboriginal people in Central Australia. It is zero hour in Greece. Hitler hurls his Luftwaffe and Wehrmacht at Britain's only fighting ally. The Greeks are already at war with Italy, whom they have stopped cold. Now Hitler must rescue his Axis partner if he is to salvage his master plan to secure the Mediterranean. Blitzkrieg in full flower crushes Greece. The British must withdraw. Freiburg's 2nd New Zealand Division was given the task of defending the coastal pass, while Mackay's 6th Australian Division was to hold the village of Bralos. Of all the interesting characters I occasionally met with, by far the most interesting and unusual was Ben. I have never met anyone quite like Ben before or since. He had a better education than was usual to find in those days. Ben always wanted to be a soldier, which is unusual for a man of his type, they can't take military discipline as a rule. When war broke out in 1939, Ben was one of the first to enlist in the 2nd Australian Imperial Force. He was killed in the evacuation of Greece in 1941. He was a marvellous rifle shot and I was told by someone who was with him in Greece that he shot down a German plane with the ordinary .303 rifle by shooting the pilot in the cockpit as he flew over. His grave, plot 3 row B number 5 at the Phaleron Cemetery near Athens is amongst thousands of other Australian soldiers who tragically lost their lives in the Greek campaign. As time went by, Ben was remembered more for his exploits as a bushman, adventurer and explorer in Central Australia than for his bravery in World War II. I was reloading my gun to shoot a bird for the Natural History Collection and it discharged when my camel Harry lurched. This movement fired the gun, shooting the ramrod through my fingers and lower jaw. After this tragic incident with Harry, Australia's first camel, he bolted never to be seen again. Explorer John Ainsworth Horrocks had to use horses again, which limited his inland explorations in a harsh environment. It was another 15 years before the Victorian government imported 24 camels on June the 13th, 1860. Pastoralist and entrepreneur Thomas Elder knew just how reliable and resilient the animals were. In 1866, he imported 121 camels and 31 cameleers to establish his transport and camel breeding business. The camels were used on the Burke and Wills expedition. Riding on the camels is much more pleasant than I anticipated, and for my work, I find it much better than riding on horseback. The animals are very quiet and easily managed much more so than horses. William Wills. But let us spare a thought today of the men and the animals crammed together on a vessel which made the perilously long voyage from Karachi. They left behind them their families and homes, many never ever to see them again. In opening up the outback, camels were not only essential to survival in a hot and arid zone, but were key to opening new townships. I could never have done the work I did, nor travel the country I travelled over, if it had not been for the full cooperation of the desert people. The camel is a better beast for getting through the rough country than a horse. His long legs mean he can take higher steps, his feet like masses of sponge rubber, never slip, and in spite of the ungainly loads, he never stumbles unless hurried unduly. 
Ben was one of the first settlers to realize that using camels instead of horses were critical in a desert environment. Born in Altunga, a gold mining town 115 kilometers west of Alice Springs, Ben soon learned to adapt to his environment. His father, Sam Nicker, was a practical man, optimistic and adventurous, having traveled 1,100 kilometers by horse and cart from Quorn in South Australia. He was a good shot with a rifle, a must if you are to survive. His mother, Liz, was never a good shot with the rifle, but she was confident that all she should ever need to do was aim it in the general direction of any human threat. Because there were few white women in the Australian inland at that time, Liz's good common sense and self-taught nursing skills were frequently called upon. She was often away from home, delivering babies or tending the sick. In his book The Man from Udnadatta, R.B. Plowman wrote, in the annals of our race there have been from time to time the names and noble doings of great women. In the loneliest places of the vast Australian continent there are women whose names and deeds are worthy of record in these annals. One is Mrs. Sam Nicker. After a brief period in the township of Stewart, the family moved north in 1914 to look for a suitable place to settle. With a few cattle, horses, sheep and a heavily laden buggy, they settled next to Ryan's well after a long walk when their buggy was damaged. They built Glen Maggie, which became their home for the next 16 years. Ryan's well became an important source of water for camel teams and travelers. Glen Maggie soon became a telegraph station once the telegraph line to Darwin was built. Billy and Clara, an Arunda Aboriginal couple who for cultural reasons were separated from their country and their tribe, shared their Arunda culture and bush knowledge with Ben. Young Ben learned his bush skills from old Billy and he became a master at hunting and tracking. They brought in extra income with kangaroo and rabbit skins. They also gathered bush tucker, told their dreamtime stories and passed on their tracking skills. In exchange they found a permanent home with the family and he grew up balanced between two cultures. With Billy and Clara's tuition he was to become fluent in several indigenous languages in the central desert region. At 15 and without a compass, he had crossed the desert alone from Halls Creek in WA to Ryan's Well in the Northern Territory. The riskiest solo adventure in inland history. Where many men had perished he had triumphed. I found Ben to be the steadiest of chaps, deeply knowledgeable in bush lore of every sort. To him to be a bushman was not just a question of instinct, so much as remembering no two trees, no two ant mounds, and no two hills were exactly the same. All was recorded in a mental picture. He carried a sketch pad and drew flowers and shrubs and trees as well as birds, lizards and insects he had never seen before. To understand the bush, one has to absorb the basic knowledge. If one knew a creature's habitat and its habits one had the blueprint for everyday living. From his early education he knew all the edible plants and which ones to avoid, as well as the special treats to look for. His family were well read. The books he carried in his saddlebags were the classics and were read and reread a dozen times and then swapped. His father Sam gave him a good grounding in history and he had taught him about science and its relation to the environment. Growing up with both backgrounds made perfect sense to Ben. On these expeditions, Ben had other things to consider, like his agreement with the Adelaide Weather Bureau and the Waite Agricultural Institute to monitor and record data on wind strengths, cloud formations and rare rainfall. 
He also reported on gravel core samples, herbage, scrublands, and grasses as well as the general topography of the area. This laid the groundwork for future explorers and settlers. Searching for gold was also a priority, which proved to be elusive for Ben. This was also the case for renowned Harold Lassiter and his search for the legendary gold reef. This camel team belonged to the late Mr. Lassiter, who perished in the desert in 1931 when in search of a cave of gold 350 miles west of Alice Springs. The search for Lassiter's body took many years and in 1936 Bob Buck, a fellow bushman who accompanied Ben on many journeys, discovered his body and made a temporary grave. The story of possible gold was always on his mind, but Ben was skeptical of Lassiter's story. They say that Ben Nicker, one of our best known bushmen, declares that Lassiter took his legend from a book published around the beginning of this century called The Gold Buckle. Nicker thinks, so thoroughly absorbed by the book that it became real to him, and he identified himself with its hero. Two sets of false teeth have been found, Nicker will tell you. Bob Buck has one, and a member of a recent gold expedition has the other. But there was no gold, even in them. The legend of Lassiter's elusive gold reef lives on. Today many believe there is still gold to be found. He traveled on ancient sacred land, which is protected today. The mystery will always remain. Little is known of this place, and the rock carvings are even lesser known. Aboriginal people, particularly in the center, don't create petroglyphs to tell their stories. So it is assumed visitors in the ancient past visited this site. Ben along with Michael Terry discovered this site and marked it for future reference. But to this day the site is still a mystery even to the local Arunda people. By the time Michael Terry arrived in Australia in 1919, he was already a seasoned veteran from World War I. He served in Russia with No. 2 Squadron of the Royal Naval Air Service Armoured Division as a mechanic an experience that would serve him well in his new life in Central Australia. Ben introduced him to camels and Central Australia's unique flora and fauna as well as the lay of the land. Michael Terry's main purpose was to find gold. This required surveying skills that only Ben and his two Aboriginal friends would have. Ben made many journeys with Michael Terry. His constant companions and mentors were Jack and Lucky, well known for their tracking skills and sourcing bush food. They also helped them to get out of sticky situations with tribal strangers who had never seen European people with white skin. After much searching, water was always a welcome relief. It allowed everyone to freshen up especially in temperatures that exceeded 40 degrees. Camels were critical for carrying provisions that saw them through long journeys that went beyond borders. There was always something to do in camp, including marking locations. But the prime role of the team was obtaining core samples for analysis for not only gold, but other minerals that required assaying. His notebooks and findings can be found in the South Australian Museum. This information was critical for government to determine the settlement of inland Australia. Not a born mechanic, Ben left the complexities of motorised transport to Michael Terry. However, he was more than happy to guide proceedings from the passenger seat. He quietly knew that camels never got bogged and crossed rivers easily. They just didn't have the speed to keep up on vast areas of open land. Little is known of this humble man who contributed so much in such a short space of time. He guided many expeditions in the centre and became renowned as the best bushman in Central Australia. Ben's reputation soon became well known and in 1936, the Foy family did something no one had ever done before, they went to Uluru, then known as Ez Rock for a family holiday. 
There was little known of this strange rock, but it soon became a fascination to all Australians and has become a tourist icon across the world. The days of camel transport were coming to an end and soon the Garn Railway and motorised transport would eventually take over. But Ben continued using his camels. Ben valued his camels above all else. They saw him through many situations. He saw other forms of transport as inferior to his beloved camels. Eventually, camels became useless in the eyes of new settlers and were released only to become a feral problem that has affected the environment that he loved so much. Ben Nicker devoted his life to the bush beyond fences. He has given his life to keep the bush free for you and me. I grieve for his wife, and with the bushmen of Central Australia, I mourn the passing of a very fine fellow. <laughs>